Hello, I'm Doug May, President of Wall Street North America. I'm coming to you from my home here in Seattle, Washington. Like you, I will be attending this year's NAMIC virtually, probably from this room. But we at Willis Street very much miss the personal interactions we enjoy every year during NAMIC. We're confident in the future of this conference and look forward to seeing you again at this event. I also want to let you know that Willis Street is making significant investments in regional companies through our wildfire and hail applications and rating agency consultation. With this in mind, please enjoy your visit to our virtual booth and don't hesitate to ask anyone at Willis Street questions about our company's services. Welcome to Dive In. Bienvenidos a Dive In. Vitaite na festival Dive In. Welcome to the Dive In Festival. Welcome to Dive In. Bienvenidos a Dive In. Welcome to Dive In. Mabuhay sa Dive In Kapistahan. Üdvözlünk a Dive-in Fesztiválon! Dabra Pazsalvet, ne Fesztivál Dive-in! Bóhi ma beim! Bóli Cloritán! Dive-in Utsabe! Abna de Sokol Kedjanai! Sádor Amontran! Dive-in Hé Jókuszó! Benvenuti a Dive-in Fesztivál! Dive-in Fesztiváline, hoz kérdés! Ahlen, mikor fi Dive-in! Welcome to Dive In 2020, local voice, global impact from your Dive In champions here in the Americas. I'm Margaret Russi Milkent of the Jacobson Group. And I'm Day Bishop from Willis Towers Watson. This is Dive In's third year at NAMIC's annual conference and our first fearless year as a global virtual diversity, equity, and inclusion conference. As you saw at the close of our video, Dive In is brought to you by our generous global sponsors across the insurance industry. A very special thank you to local sponsor NAMIC for today's timely Future of Work session. And I'd like to thank you, the audience, for joining us all today for this session on the Future of Work. We are all experiencing firsthand how and where we work is changing today. Not only is how and where we work changing, but technology is pushing us forward so quickly that we're needing to constantly learn new skills to keep pace with this, with this constant change. So we're delighted to have experts with us today to talk to us about the future of work and the skills that we need to keep relevant going forward. So our speakers today are Chris Winans, founder, Chris Winans Consulting, Deanna Mulligan, CEO of Guardian Life, and also author of Higher Purpose, How Smart Companies Can Close the Skills Gap. And then we'll be led with a live Q&A session by Tracy Malcolm, global leader of Future of Work at Willis Towers Watson. And now I'd like to turn it over to Chris. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Dive In, for inviting me to participate uh, here today. My name is Chris Winans. I'm a communications consultant. I've worked with several insurance companies over the years, including Guardian Life, one of the largest mutual life insurers in the country. Guardian CEO Deanna Mulligan, who you'll hear from in a few minutes, says, pursue purpose and profits will follow. It's a core conviction she advocates in her new book, Higher Purpose, how smart companies can close the skills gap. Notice higher is spelled H-I-R-E. The book addresses the problem of training people for the jobs of the future, and that is a purpose worth pursuing. 
the importance of having a purpose resonates with me. A few years ago, when I was at Hill and Knowlton Strategies, the PR agency coined a related concept. It goes like this, purpose plus performance equals preference. So in other words, your customers will reach out to you if you can demonstrate purpose and the ability to perform. The key word, of course, is purpose. Uh, and recent research from McKinsey suggests that while CEOs increasingly embrace being purpose-driven, less than half of surveyed workers said their company's stated purpose had much effect. This leads to my first communication technique and tip. No technique or tip will matter unless you have something compelling to say. Ideally, something new, insightful, actionable, and above all, authentic. That's what Deanna's book, Higher Purpose, offers. Having something important to say is key. The message has to be useful. It's not as easy as it sounds. And which channels you leverage matters but not as much as the substance. Substance, after all, should dictate form, not the other way around. Uh, notice here in this uh, pie chart that while content seems to pale in comparison to how the presenter delivers the message and their credentials, the channel isn't even a factor. Apologies to Marshall McLuhan, but the medium is the megaphone, but it's not the message. The message is the message. And much of the stuff that flows through pipelines like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn is derivative. The content often originates on professional journalism platforms, platforms with credibility. My second point is that virtual presentation skills are critical in the new world of remote everything. The camera is inches from the presenter's nose, case in point. That means it may be harder than ever, as the cynical saying goes, to fake sincerity to succeed. Communicating via Teams and Zoom requires a whole new level of attention to detail. How close do I need to be to the camera? Pretty close. What's in the background that could be distracting? And without a stage to share with a slideshow, you might be better off with fewer, simpler slides, or no slides at all. Slides are often a crutch. So don't bother with slides unless they truly enhance the impact of your message. This is pretty consistent with what uh, presentation coaches often advise. Keep your audience focused on you and not on an array of data crammed slides. Virtual presentations make this guidance even more relevant. Want to do a big data dump on your audience? Give them a takeaway of it. Email to them afterwards. Don't distract them with it while you're talking. So what matters more than how? It's the what. What you say still matters more than how you transmit it. The how helps, but the what and the why are where the meat is. Above all, know who, who it is that you want to do what as a result of listening to you. Remember, we remember more what we hear than how we heard it. I mean, how many times have you remembered what you heard, read, or saw, but couldn't remember whether you heard, read, or saw it, let alone who said it? Ultimately, we absorb compelling messages with the power to change our minds, ideas that challenge the conventional wisdom. Almost no matter how or where we receive these messages. We want to be enlightened. We crave fresh perspectives not rehashed information or insights we've already heard. Much of my career has been about not finding something new, but finding a new way to think about things. It's also about finding the right platform for optimal exposure or amplification in today's vernacular. Social media are great channels, but they risk becoming a sort of pandemic of distortion and inaccuracy. And that's the point of this uh, cartoon you're looking at now. Still, digital disruption is here now, not years away as this guy is telling his team. So no question, COVID has transformed how we communicate and digital is the name of the game. 
It's a big reason the future of work looks so different from the past. As De Deanna notes, people need to learn new skills because companies are compelled to do things differently. Delivered digitally or not, it's still the case that the most responsible traditional media are the places where everyone wants to be seen and heard. Professional outlets like the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, Bloomberg, Reuters, Associated Press, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The LA Times. These are the originators of the most trusted reporter reporting that gets reposted on social. Their coverage is what ends up getting amplified on social. But some social media feature communicators unrestrained by journalistic standards of fairness, balance, and accuracy. You want to be careful about who you share your preferred media spaces with. But social media is increasingly the only way people get their news. Many times I mention something I read in the Wall Street Journal to my teenage daughter. Often she has already heard or read about it, but isn't always aware of the origin. But if she accessed it on uh, Instagram, for example, for her it's credible, although increasingly people who are posting on social are citing their sources because they're, they're increasingly aware of the lack of uh, credibility of a lot of social outlets. The point is that with the proliferation of smartphones, we're back to storytelling around a campfire. Only now, the light isn't coming from a campfire, it's emanating from smartphones and laptops, and often in real time via Zoom and Teams and the like. Still some principles of audience engagement apply regardless of the channel. Speak from the audience's viewpoint, keep the concepts and language simple, and remember it's about them, not you. With that, I'd like to welcome Guardians Deanna Mulligan to talk about her new book, Higher Purpose, and the path to reskilling the workforce of the future. We're back. I'm with uh, Deanna Mulligan, CEO of Guardian Life and author of a new book, Higher Purpose, How Smart Companies Can Close the Skills Gap. I note the word higher in the title is spelled H-I-R-E, and the double meaning is, of course, intentional. Deanna, you started work on this book a few years ago. Writing a book is a big commitment, especially for someone whose job is being the CEO of one of America's largest mutual life insurers. So what did you see happening in companies that convinced you this was a book you wanted to write? Well, thanks, Chris. And I'd just like to say it's great to be here with all of you. Uh, yes, um, this book has been a few years in the making. And going back to the financial crisis of 2008, I saw coming out of that crisis many people having a very difficult time regaining their footing. And I think that was across the spectrum in the United States, but particularly there were a lot of middle management companies, a lot, a lot of middle management employees of big companies whom one would think were normally fairly immune to having financial difficulties, all of a sudden finding themselves in a place where they couldn't return to work and they needed to work. And I thought a lot about that and about what role companies could play in helping the country get back on its feet from an employment perspective. Now, prior to the COVID-19 um, recent situation, that kind of unemployment was only a kind of a dull memory for many people, but I started the book during a time when it was a very sharp and, you know, I think painful episode in our country's history. And over the years, the content of the book has evolved from how do we get people reemployed to now that we have full employment, but a very changing internal uh, to companies' environment, where whereby digitization is becoming increasingly important, how do we take the employees we have 
and upskill and reskill them to match the new needs and the new requirement. And now I think COVID-19 is only accelerating that situation inside of companies and, and particularly inside of insurance companies. Well, you know, higher purpose does spell out why companies should commit the resources to creating lifelong learning opportunities for their workers. And even if it means making it easier for them to change jobs. So what's the logic behind that strategy? And how does it benefit the company that takes that approach? What, what's been the guardian experience? Well, we find that employees are really excited about having opportunities to retrain and Im improve their skills and potentially go back to school part time. And we have not seen people taking their new skills and leaving the company. Although, of course, that's always an option. When you have top talent and you help people develop their skills, they are going to be attractive to other companies. But I think that's a risk worth taking in terms of making sure you have the best people and the right people for the new jobs that are emerging. I also say in your book that um, a four-year college degree maybe isn't always the be-all, end-all career path uh, for success, especially when the result is more than uh, 1.6 trillion of debt weighing on the graduates. So what are some alternative approaches to launching a career? Well, a four-year degree is great, but as we know, it hasn't in the past worked for everyone. And we have had a, a really good experience at Guardian in working with community colleges and hiring community college grads. Um, many of them come to us as interns and we find that uh, their skills are a good match for what we are. They can then complete their degree if they want to via Guardian's uh, very generous uh, tuition reimbursement program. We've also hired people from places like code academies. Uh, we are looking to, as all companies, and I think particularly insurance companies are doing right now, we're really looking to increase our inclusion and diversity and going to places that uh, aren't necessarily the usual four-year college campuses not only has given us access to some great talent that we can further develop uh, after they arrive on our campus, but also given us access to a much more diverse workforce, which is really important to us right now. Is there, uh, are there a couple of examples that uh, you could talk about? I think that um, you've done things with uh, the City University of New York. Um, can you talk about that uh, for a minute? Sure, um, we've uh, taken on internships from the City, City University of New York. Again, a very diverse talent pool, but also their graduates tend to be very successful, particularly in financial services where we're looking. And we have had the opportunity to kind of weigh in on with them and with their administration on what kinds of skills um, we're looking for, what kinds of classes would be useful. They're developing a a minor in cybersecurity, for example, which um, many of their scholarship uh, students have opted into. And we have looked at that program to build out a field where, you know, new cyber graduates are in very short supply. Um, we've also done things like uh, develop our own internal programs. Uh, one we're working on right now is open to call center agents who would like to learn coding. And, uh, and become programmers for us. That's in pilot, but so far we've had some very successful graduates of that program. And that program really is a good example of how technological advances are constantly changing the skills that a company needs uh, for their employees to, to master. Um, the, um, I guess the real question is, how do you strike the right balance between deciding which employees uh, really need to be trained for something outside of your company versus re really reskilling them. You know, just how far can you go? What are the pressures that uh, you see in trying to strike that balance? Well, I think you've heard of some of the tech companies who have said we're going to be uh, training people and we realize that some of these people may decide they want to become, you know, nurses or 
airplane pilots or you know use their technical skills to do other things other than than work for us and you know we kind of share that philosophy but again we haven't had a lot of those types of cases we said in the very beginning we want to train in and train out so uh, train people as they come in and if we get to the place where their uh, job is one that we no longer need and they can't find a job internally we have in some cases paid for community college tuition for people who are leaving us so that they can retrain into another job. So what are some of the unique challenges that the insurance industry faces as we head into the future of work, say in underwriting and distribution, and that could apply to both the, your business, the life insurance business, as well as the property casualty insurance industry? Well, if you take uh, one job category that's common to many insurance companies, and that's actuaries. Actuaries are very important in terms of obviously setting prices and rates and reserves and lots of different things. And over time, they have been taught to use sampling. You know, they, they do a lot of their statistical work via sampling. And when you think forward to the computing power that's available in the cloud, sampling becomes less of an issue as opposed to just using all the data you can possibly find. So we decided to start a pilot program to retrain some of our actuaries to be data scientists. And it was a pretty intense program, um, 20 hours a week on top of their regular full-time job of studying and attending class for a year. And one of our recent graduates from that program did take a job in our data analytics area where we have a lot of uh, PhD graduates. Um, this person does not have a PhD, but he's had a very successful first year and ended up being a very highly ranked person uh, within the department. So we're excited about that opportunity, which takes a, what you might call a typical insurance company job and upskills it for a more digital and data-driven environment. Well, the year 2020 so far has posed some enormous challenges. Uh, the pandemic has forced entire companies to operate rem remotely. It's also created uh, economic pressures, especially for small businesses and gig, gig workers. Um, as I noted before, you started work on higher purpose long before the pandemic and its fallout. So. How has this crisis influenced your thinking about the future of work? Well, I think we all are familiar with the headlines that the crisis is putting many more people out of work, be it temporarily or possibly permanently as people's you know, habits change and as their economic situation changes. So I think it's more important now than it ever has been for companies to really engage in training their people um, to the extent that companies find they have redundant workers. It would be fabulous if they could help those workers retrain for a new job. So I think COVID-19 has really uh, pushed companies to think about digitization. It's forced companies in some cases to furlough workers for whom they don't have jobs. And I think it's, it's an issue that might be uh, too large for government or not-for-profits to solve on their own. I think companies need to engage in thinking about how to reskill and retrain our workforce. Let me ask you, um, I know that Guardian, like a lot of companies, went through a huge uh, disruption eight years ago when Superstorm Sandy hit the New York City area. Can you talk a little bit about how that played into your strategy for how to deal with crisis? Well, we left our offices in lower Manhattan on a Friday and didn't return for roughly nine months after Superstorm Sandy. We had five feet of water in our lobby, but more importantly, it, the street in front of our building contained a tunnel that was full of asbestos. And when that tunnel came apart, uh, it also contained our electrical and a lot of our internet um, hookups. So in order for the companies to get in and fix all of those things, they first had to do asbestos remediation. So we were without electricity, which meant we couldn't work in our 27-story uh, building by order of State of New York. 
for almost nine months. And I have to say we were lucky and we were somewhat prepared, but we weren't as prepared as we could have been. We ended up meeting all of our customer obligations, all of our regulatory obligations, but only because our employees went to super, I would say made superhuman efforts to make sure that we closed our books on time. And you know, they did things like call customers to give them their personal cell phone numbers because our phone system went down. And when we had recovered from all that and moved back into our building, I said, never again. We're never going to have this happen to us again. We need to be location independent. And that was the start of a strategy that led us to where we are today. So when we needed to work from home in the COVID-19 um, shutdown of the state of New York, we instantly overnight really transitioned to work from home and we haven't had any issues. Our customer service uh, marks have stayed very high from our customers. We haven't missed any service level agreements and our employee engagement is very high. So the first crisis led us to be much more prepared for the second one, but also prepared us for the future of work in terms of having um, employees who are much more able to work in a disconnected manner, in a remote manner from the home office to work in multiple locations and to be self-sufficient and self-starting with technology. We also had dramatically reduced the amount of paper and paper files that we kept. We have virtually almost no paper um, in our system anywhere, and that's helped a lot in this virtual environment. So talk a little bit about how employee morale has uh, fared through this through this period and in terms of adapting to meeting employees needs including for uh, for the in the reskilling efforts but uh, just generally what's you talked about a little bit about the positive feedback you, you've gotten can you talk a little bit about what's your sense of morale overall before and after a pandemic well, morale was high before the pandemic, but I think it's it's even higher in most quarters after, even though we're not going to minimize the impact on employees of, you know, in some cases, homeschooling their children and, and having to protect themselves and their loved ones and perhaps their elderly family members uh, from the virus. We hear a lot of stories of people being very appreciative of the flexibility we've provided them, really not missing their commute at all, because in many of our locations, we have people who commute a long distance and appreciating the support that we gave them in the beginning of the transition to all remote work, where we helped them purchase appropriate tables and chairs, for example, that were uh, ergonomically efficient, helped them integrate except excuse me help them upgrade their internet strategy mm -hmm. uh, at home and help them uh, pay for some upgraded uh, access for example all those things i think have gone a long way to making people feel supported and as comfortable as they can be in the new 100 percent work from home environment that we have so our audience here today is uh uh, almost a, entirely mutual insurance companies. And you write in Higher Purpose, as I noted earlier, that uh, if you pursue purpose, profits will follow. So it's a belief you've held long before uh, the, the crisis of 2008. Can you, can you share with us how this philosophy animates the mission of a mutual insurer like Guardian? Well, at Guardian, we have three core values. We do the right thing, people count, and we hold ourselves to a very high standard. And those values were in place when I arrived. I didn't create them, but I took saw an opportunity and took that opportunity to make those three values the real core decision-making um, apparatus at Guardian. And you'll hear people in meetings talk about and challenge each other about how a certain action or initiative uh, might be impacted by the values or whether a certain idea falls within the values. So I think that purpose is very much a given for most mutual companies when you're owned by your policyholders. You don't have a lot of conflict between what's good for the customer and what's good for your owner. And I think that's a terrific feature of 
mutual companies. At Guardian, we've said that we are a purpose-driven company. We're very forward about that when we're interviewing people. And we find in most cases that to be a real attraction. Some people, you know, might want to work for other kinds of companies and it's better to sort those out at the beginning. So we talk a lot about our purpose and our values. Uh, but we also want to make profits because we return about 70% of our uh, profits to our owners, our mutual company policyholders. So we pay close attention to performance as well. And you know, in this COVID year, we don't know how things will turn out, but in the last four years in a row, we've had record profits while heavily pursuing our purpose-driven ideal. Well, Thank you very much, Deanna, uh, for joining us today. Um, I know your new book, Higher Purpose, covers a lot of what we've discussed today. And by the way, uh, you'll see on this uh, slide how to pre-order the book. Uh, but again, thank you very much. It's been great having this conversation with you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be with you today.